Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I would like to welcome you all to Muhammad Mabrook Microbiology World. And in today's lecture, I am going to talk about coronavirus COVID-19. At the beginning of this lecture, and as an introduction, I'm going to talk about coronavirus day as a family. Then after that, I'm going to give you brief introduction into other pathogenic strains of the coronavirus day. I'll be talking about severe acute respiratory syndrome virus or SARS. And then I'm going to talk about Middle East respiratory syndrome virus. And then from slide number 12, and for the entire lecture, I will be talking about coronavirus, COVID-19 in much, much more detail. At the end of this lecture, please do not forget to subscribe to our channel. I'm going to start this lecture by talking about coronavirus D family. Members of coronavirus day family are characterized by having a large enveloped positive sense RNA. Members of the family of coronavirus day they characterize by having a high rate of recombination. This high rate of recombination among members of the coronavirus day family resulted in the emerging of a highly pathogenic coronaviruses like SARS, MERS, and now coronavirus COVID-19. And this virus, which has been emerged about one year ago, caused a high rate of morbidity and mortality all over the world. Now, if we look at the morphology of members of the coronaviruses. Members of the coronaviruses, if we examine them under electron microscope, they have a distinctive arrangement of spikes, or we call them peplomeres. These peplomeres projecting from the surface of the virus. What you see here in this diagram, this is electron micrograph of a coronavirus. And you can see that on the surface of the coronavirus, we have these projections, which I'm pointing at them with my laser pointer. These projections on the surface of the coronavirus, we call them spikes or peplomeres. So these peplomeres or spikes on the surface of the coronavirus, as you see here in this electron micrograph, will give the coronavirus the appearance of the crown, the appearance of the crown, as you see here in this electron micrograph, which I'm pointing at with my laser pointer. You can see that the virus or the coronavirus have a crown appearance. Members of the coronaviruses, they are viruses that cause infection in a human, and usually these infections are mild. These infections are occurring in the nose, sinuses, or the upper respiratory tract or throat. However, some types of family coronavirus, they, they caused a very serious diseases with special reference to SARS, MERS and now coronavirus COVID-19 as we are going to describe in much, much more detail within this lecture. This slide demonstrating the general morphology of coronaviruses. And as you can see here in this diagram, and as I have mentioned previously, the virus has a single stranded RNA. This viral RNA is surrounded by the capsid, which we call it the 
nucleocapsid or uh, N protein. So here you see RNA surrounded by the nucleocapsid or the N protein, which is the N protein you can see it as pink color in this diagram. After that, the viral nucleocapsid is surrounded by viral envelope, which you see it here in red. The viral envelope, the viral envelope, which is this one, contained spikes. So we call them spike protein or S protein or spike glycoprotein. Also, the virus has, which you see it here in blue color, hemagglutinin esterase dimer or HE protein. And this is the virus from outside. So you can see here the S protein or the spike glycoprotein in yellow color. Blue color is the hemagglutinin esterase dimer or HE protein. And this one in red is the viral envelope. The red one here is the viral envelope and the spike are projecting from the viral envelope. So this is the morphology of, or the general morphology of coronaviruses. In this slide, we can see a diagram demonstrating the general replication for coronaviruses. So here we have the coronavirus, and then you can see the S protein or the spike protein, which looks like black colored clips. You see them here. So then what will happen is, the spike protein will bind to the cell receptor. So the cell receptor here appear in blue color, and you can see that this protein or the spike protein of coronavirus is attached to the cell receptor. Now, this is the cell membrane, cell receptor, and this is the cytoplasm of the cell. And this is the endoplasmic reticulum. So then the first step is the attachment of the coronavirus with its spike protein into the cell receptor on the cell membrane. Then after that what will happen is the coronavirus will get into the cell through the endocytic vesicle. You cannot see it here in this diagram, but I can I will going to show it to you in the next slides in this lecture. Then, once the coronavirus gets into the cell, it will lose its nucleocapsid and we will end having a naked viral RNA in the cytoplasm of the cell. You can see the naked viral RNA as a red color. You see it here. This is the naked viral RNA. Don't forget that coronavirus, it has a positive strand RNA. As I have mentioned in previous lectures, positive strand RNA, it means that it can act as a messenger RNA and it can be translated to viral protein. Now, so then what will happen is some of these positive strand will be translated into viral polymerase. It will produce RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Or let's give it another, another name is Viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Now, so this viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase, it will do what? It will convert the, the positive strand RNA of coronavirus into negative strand. So you can see the positive strand is red color and the negative strand is green color. Green color. So this is the positive in red. And the green is the negative strand of the viral RNA. So then RNA dependent RNA polymerase, okay, will change negative, uh, sorry, will change positive strand RNA into negative strand from red to green color. Then what will happen after that? Then the negative strand, which you see it here in green color, okay, will convert into positive strand okay as you see here now this positive strand this positive strand because 
positive strand act as a messenger RNA. So it will be translated into different viral proteins. So this positive strand of the viral RNA will be translated first into a protein. You can see them as gray circles. You see them here. Now this gray circles is the nucleocapsid protein. Now these gray circles will go and bind to the positive strand viral RNA. You see it here. So then what will happen is the binding between the nucleocapsid protein and the viral RNA to form the nucleocapsid, which you see it here, nucleocapsid. So you can see the viral RNA in red surrounded by these gray circles. Okay? Then, after that, what happens? Some of these are, now we said that the positive uh, sense RNA can act as a messenger RNA. It will be translated to proteins. One of these proteins is the nucleoprotein or the nucleocapsid protein, which will bind to the RNA to form the nucleocapsid. Some of this positive sense RNA, it will be translated to other viral protein. It will be translated to M protein. This M protein, which you see here, it will become and insert itself into the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is the endoplasmic reticulum, and you can see this is the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, and you can see this is the formation of the M protein. So this is the M protein. And you see them here. This is the M protein. So M protein insert itself into the upper surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. Some of these positive RNA will be translated into, into S protein. This S protein will embed itself, which you see here like a black clip, it will insert itself into the inner membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is the S protein. Also, some of this RNA or positive sense RNA will be translated into the HE protein and it will insert itself as well into the membrane of the or inner membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Then inside the endoplasmic reticulum, what will happen is we have the assembly step. So what will happen is, you know, the newly synthesized nucleocapsid, you see it here, which we described here that when the, RN, the nucleocapsid will bind to the RNA to form the nucleocapsid. This nucleocapsid will go inside the endoplasmic reticulum. So you have it, you see it here. Then this newly formed nucleocapsid will be surrounded by the viral protein. The viral protein means what? It means the M protein, which you see it here, okay? H and E protein and the S protein, like the black clamp. Then after that, this newly formed nucleocapsid will be released from the endoplasmic reticulum into the where? Into the cytoplasm. Into the cytoplasm will be taken by the Golgi and then the Golgi will transport it through the cell membrane. And then once the virus will be released from the cell membrane, it will acquire its envelope from the cell membrane. So this is slide summarize the replication or the general replication plans for the coronavirus. Okay. This cartoon summarizing the replication of coronavirus. What you see here, this is the coronavirus and this is the cell. This is the cell membrane, this is a cell receptor and this is the cytoplasm of the cell. So then what will happen is the coronavirus will come and utilizes its spike protein or S protein to attach to the cell receptor. So this is the cell receptor and here you can see the attachment between the spike protein with the cell receptor. So the first step is the attachment between viral spike protein and cell receptor. Then after that what will happen is, you cannot see it here in this diagram, but the coronavirus will enter the cell by endocytosis. So then the coronavirus will be inside the endocytic vesicle. Then after that, what will happen is the pH in the endocytic vesicle will drop and this will result in the fusion between 
the viral envelope and the vesicle membrane. This will be followed by the release of the virus into the cytoplasm and then the uncoating and then we will have the naked viral coronavirus RNA in the cytoplasm of the cell as you can see here. So I can see here the coronavirus RNA as a blue color strand. You see it here. And it is positive sense RNA. So here when you say genomic RNA, this meaning the viral RNA. And it is a positive sense from 5 prime to 3 prime. Because it is a positive strand RNA, so it can act as a messenger RNA. So then it can be translated uh, into RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Okay? So then the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase will convert the positive sense or positive strand coronavirus RNA into a negative sense. So you can see the positive sense is from 5 prime to 3 prime, negative sense from 3 to 5. This is positive, this is negative. Then what will happen after that? Under the influence of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, this negative sense will become a positive sense and will form more copies of the positive sense RNA of the coronavirus. So here, what we have is a positive sense RNA of the coronavirus from 5 prime to 3 prime. And as I mentioned previously, under the influence of RNA dependent RNA polymerase, it will make a negative sense which is from 3 to 5. Why? Because the negative sense is complementary to the positive sense. Or, other word, we can say that the negative sense is the mirror image of the positive sense. And then, as I mentioned previously, the positive strand RNA, it can act as a messenger RNA, so it will be translated to RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. The RNA-dependent RNA polymerase will form the negative strand RNA from the positive strand RNA of the coronavirus. Then what will happen is, this negative strand RNA, which is from 3 to 5 prime, under the influence again of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, will make more will make more copies of the positive sense RNA of the coronavirus as you see here. So all of these ones are newly formed or sensitized positive sense RNA of the coronavirus. Now some of these newly sensitized positive sense RNA of the coronavirus will be translated to different viral protein. For example, this positive sense RNA of coronavirus will be translated to S protein. This one to non-structural protein. This one to the E protein. This one or this RNA will be translated to M protein. This positive strand RNA of corona will be translated to non-structural protein. The same thing, non-structural protein. This one as well, non-structural protein. And this one, which is another, this one is another positive or newly sensitized positive sense or positive strand RNA of coronavirus will be translated to the N protein. Some of the newly sensitized positive strand RNA of the coronavirus does not get translated into viral protein. It will remain as an coronavirus positive sense RNA. So this is a newly sensitized positive strand RNA as well. Okay, then what will happen is, as you see here, the N protein, which is the nucleocapsid protein, will come and bind to the newly sensitized positive strand RNA. It will come and bind to the newly sensitized positive strand RNA. So here you see the positive strand RNA in blue color. Okay. And then you can see the red dot, which is the N protein binding to the positive strand RNA of the coronavirus. Then what will happen? This newly formed nucleoprotein and the newly sensitized positive strand RNA of the coronavirus will migrate to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. 
The same thing, all the newly sensitized viral protein like the S protein, E protein, M protein, all of them will go into the rough in the plasmic reticulum. And when these three, S protein or spike protein, E protein, M protein, will go to the rough in the plasmic reticulum, they will embed themselves into the membrane of the rough in the plasmic reticulum. And then in the rough in the plasmic reticulum, the newly sensitized the newly sensitized viral RNA or positive strand RNA of the coronavirus with, which as I mentioned previously, bound to the N protein to form the nucleocapsid RNA will go and meet the newly sensitized viral proteins, which is the S, E, and M protein, which embedded themselves in the rough in the plasmic reticulum in a process we call it assembly. So the assembly of the coronavirus is occurring in the rough in the plasmic reticulum. Here you can see this is the strand or the positive strand viral or coronavirus RNA and you can see this red nucleoprotein as a red dots in it and here this is the rough in the plasmic reticulum membrane and you can see the for example the S protein which is this one A protein which this one and the blue one dot is M protein all of them are embedded in the membrane of the rough in the plasmic reticulum and then as I mentioned in this rough in the plasmic reticulum this nucleocapsid which is the nucleoprotein and the RNA will meet the viral protein and the assembly will be happening or occurring so the assembly are occurring in the between the viral proteins and the nucleocapsid are occurring in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Also, during this process, some of the viral spike protein will embed themselves, as you see it here, in the cell membrane. Uh, okay, so this is the spike protein embedded in the cell membrane. Then after that, and after the assembly, okay, then the virus or the provirus will go into the Golgi or Golgi apparatus, and then from Golgi apparatus, it will be taken by exocytic vesicle you can see it by the vesicle here and then through this vesicle the coronavirus will be leaving or budding from the cell membrane by exocytosis by exocytosis and then when the virus is leaving the cell membrane it will take some of the spike protein from the cell membrane and then the virus will be released from the cell and then it will go and infect another cell. Now we are going to talk about pathogenic types of coronaviridae or family coronaviridae. The first pathogenic type and the member of the family coronaviridae is the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus or the SARS virus. The SARS coronavirus, abbreviation SARS-CoV, was first identified in the year 2003. The SARS-CoV virus, at the beginning it's thought to be an animal virus, and also scientists are uncertain regarding the animal reservoir for the SARS virus. However, they thought it is the bat. So what happened is that the bat got, as you see it here in this slide, got infected with coronavirus. And then the bat infected the civet cats, which you see it here, this is the civet or kyvet cats, which got infected with the coronavirus from the bat. And then a genetic recombination occurred in the civet cats and resulted in the SARS virus or SARS-CoV virus. And then the SARS-CoV virus transmitted to the human and led to the SARS outbreak. The epidemic of SARS affected 26 countries and resulted in more than 8,000 deaths in the year 2003. Let's look, if we look at the clinical manifestation of infection 
with the severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS, usually post infection, the clinical manifestation starts with flu like symptoms. These flu like symptoms will include fever, chills, muscle aches, and sometimes the patient will have diarrhea. After one week from the appearance of the initial signs or from the appearance of the flu like signs, the patient will develop a high fever of 38 degrees centigrade or more, a dry cough, and also the patient will have shortness of breath. Most of the people who they got infected with SARS, they develop pneumonia and they will have breathing problems. And these breathing problems will become severe. And because of these patients will having severe breathing problems, they will require mechanical respirator in order to help them to breathe. SARS is considered to be fatal. Why? Because it can lead to respiratory failure. Now, if we look, if we look at the diagnosis of SARS virus in the laboratory, and as recommended by the Center of Disease Control or CDC, diagnosis of SARS virus by ELISA and by a real-time polymerase chain reaction or RT-PCR. For the doctors or physicians, infection with the SARS virus or SARS-CoV virus are suspected if the patient will come to the doctor with a fever of 38 degrees centigrade or more than that, and the patient will be having a typical pneumonia. The WHO have considered of using a term we call it probable. Probable means that the chest x-ray of the patient will be showing a typical pneumonia. A typical pneumonia, it means that the chest x-ray will be showing abnormality of batchy infiltrate, like what you see here in this slide, batchy infiltrate. So this is an indication of a typical pneumonia. Also, the WHO have added a category, we call it laboratory confirmed SARS. Laboratory confirmed SARS, it means that the patient is X-ray does not show the white, or sorry, does not show the batchy infiltrate. However, the patient is positive for infection with the SARS virus by ELISA and RT-PCR. And RT-PCR. So this is describing the laboratory diagnosis and the general diagnosis of infection with the SARS virus. Now we are going to look another pathogenic type and another pathogenic member of the family coronaviridae. This important pathogenic member of the family coronaviridae, we call it middle yeast respiratory syndrome or MERS virus. If we look at the history of the MERS virus, previously around 775 people have died from infection with the middle yeast respiratory syndrome or MERS virus. This virus appeared firstly in Saudi Arabia in the year 2012. And then this virus appeared in other Middle Eastern countries, in African, Asian, and appeared as well in Europe. In the year April 2014, the first American patient was hospitalized due to infection with the MERS virus, and that was in the, in, in the city Indiana. And then another case was reported in Florida in America. Both of these patients has been returned recently from Saudi Arabia. Around one year after that, which is in May 2015, an outbreak of MERS virus appeared in Korea. And that was considered to be one of the largest outbreaks that appeared outside Saudi Arabia. If we look at the hypothesis on how MERS virus 
or MERS coronavirus arise there. It is hypothesized that the coronavirus infected the bat. And then the bat infected camel in Saudi Arabia. And then genetic recombination occurred and the MERS arise and then the MERS got transmitted to a human in Saudi Arabia who came in contact with the infected camel. Okay. Let's look at the clinical manifestation of infection with the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. The clinical manifestation of infection with the MERS cov virus will be as follows. The patient will have fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Also, some patient maybe will have gastrointestinal manifestations, and this gastrointestinal manifestation will include diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Some people or some patients with the MERS or who they are infected with the MERS virus, they will have it or they will develop pneumonia. Some of them, they will develop kidney failure. And also, it has been shown that three to four out of every 10 people infected with the MERS virus, they will die. So it is a serious disease. Let's look at the laboratory diagnosis of infection with the MERS coronavirus. If we look at the specimen, the center of disease control recommended a multiple specimen in order to establish a diagnosis of infection with coronavirus. This specimen will include lower bronchial alveolar lavage, sputum and tracheal aspirates, and also we can collect samples from the upper respiratory tract. This sample will include nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swab. In addition to that, we can our other specimen that we can use in order to establish a diagnosis for infection with the MERS coronavirus is serum and stool specimen. The type of laboratory test that we can do in the lab to establish a diagnosis of infection with the MERS coronavirus, we have ELISA, and in the ELISA, we use two different antibodies to detect MERS CoV proteins. The first protein which we can detect, or the first MERS protein which we can detect by ELISA is the nucleocapsid protein or the N protein, as I mentioned that previously. And also, we have antibodies to detect the spike protein or S protein by utilizing ELISA. Now, say for example, if the patient is came positive for infection with the MERS coronavirus, then the CDC or the Center of Disease Control recommended to use another confirmatory test, which is a micro neutralization test. And this is to confirm if the patient is positive. Now, what is a micro neutralization assay or test? This is, as I mentioned previously, this is a confir confirmatory test to measure neutralizing antibodies or antibodies that it can neutralize the virus. This is a good method for, con confirm for confirming infection with MERS coronavirus. However, this method has some drawbacks because it's a labor intensive and it is time consuming. And then it required a long time, which is about five days, because before the results will be available to the doctor. Now, this micro neutralization assay is considered one of the standard or the golden technique for the diagnosis or laboratory diagnosis of infection with the MERS coronavirus. Another important technique which we can use as a confirmatory technique for infection with MERS coronavirus is real-time BCR, real-time polymerase chain reaction. In the previous slide, we have talked about pathogenic uh, types of the family coronaviridae, and we have uh, talked about SARS coronavirus and Middle East respiratory syndrome virus or MERS virus. And now we are talking about another 
pathogenic type of the family coronaviridae, which is coronavirus COVID-19, or we can call it SARS-CoV-2. The coronavirus COVID-19 is a new type of coronavirus. The first case of this virus was reported on the 31st of December 2019 in a city in China by the name Wuhan City in the Hopi province in the People Republic of China. So this is the Wuhan City and this is the city in, in which coronavirus COVID-19 was seen for the first time. To date, coronavirus COVID-19 infected around 52 million individuals around the world and caused the deaths of more than 1,281,000 individuals. And to date, nearly 36.5 million recovered from infection with coronavirus COVID-19. So you can see that infection with coronavirus COVID-19 causes a disease of high rate of morbidity and mortality. If we look at the morphology of coronavirus COVID-19, as I have described previously, it is or it's characterized by the presence of positive strand RNA, as you see it here in this slide. So this is the positive stranded RNA. Okay. Positive stranded RNA is surrounded by is surrounded by the viral capsid. Then the nucleocapsid, which is the viral RNA and the nucleic acid, is surrounded by envelope. So this is the viral envelope. This one. This is the viral envelope. In the viral envelopes, we have spikes. For example, we have the spike glycoprotein or the S protein, which is this one. We have the hemagglutinin acetyl esterase glycoprotein, which is this one, this one which is in yellow color. Also, we have the M protein, which you see them in, which you see them in green color. And these ones is the, as I mentioned previously, this is the nucleocapsid phosphoprotein, these red color ones. Okay, so this is the structure of coronavirus COVID-19. This diagram was published in New England Journal of Medicine. As you have described previously, the replication of coronavirus. In general, now I'm going to talk about the replication or what we know about the replication of coronavirus COVID-19. So this is coronavirus COVID-19. And then you can see that the coronavirus will be attached to a cell receptor. The cell receptor for coronavirus, we call it angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. So this is the ACE2 and here you can see that the coronavirus by using its S protein or spike protein is attached to the ACE2 receptor on the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane. After the attachment, the virus will enter into the cell by endocytosis. And here you can see the coronavirus COVID-19 inside the vesicle. Then what will happen? The pH will be dropped in this vesicle and this will result in the fusion between the viral envelope and the vesicles and this will re lead to the release of the, the virus into the cytoplasm and then we will have what we call it the uncoating process and then we will have the naked positive strand viral RNA of the COVID-19 coronavirus in the cytoplasm of the cell. As I have mentioned previously that 
the coronavirus COVID-19 is a positive strand RNA. So it is viral RNA or genomic RNA of the virus, and it is a positive strand. Positive strand means that the viral RNA, it can act as a messenger RNA, and it can be translated into viral protein. So then what will happen in the first instance that the positive strand viral RNA will be translated okay, into protein. This protein usually, as I mentioned in the previous slide, will be the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So the function of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase as an enzyme, it will make first a negative copy, as you see it here, this is a negative copy of the, or from the, the positive copy of the viral RNA. So then, I repeat again, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase will be making a negative copy from the positive stranded or positive copy of the coronavirus COVID-19 RNA. So this is from 5 to 3 prime. This is the positive sense from 5 to 3. And then the negative is from 3 to 5. This will be followed by the replication. Okay. Then this will be followed by replication and, as it said here, translation. Let's describe how that happens. So then I have negative strand coronavirus COVID-19 RNA. Then it will be, this one will become positive sense RNA. So then it will be replicating and producing many copies of positive sense RNA. So then we have positive sense RNA will become negative sense and then the negative will become again as a positive. And in the positive, it can act as a messenger RNA and it can be translated to protein. Okay. So then what will happen is, as I mentioned, the negative will give us many copies of the positive sense or positive strand viral RNA of coronavirus COVID-19. Also, also, because coronavirus, as I mentioned, is a positive sense RNA. The positive sense RNA of coronavirus COVID-19 will be translated into, it will be translated into coronavirus COVID-19 proteins, which is including the S protein, which is here a bit gray in color. Then we have the A protein, as I mentioned previously. Okay. And then we have the M protein. The A protein is in yellow color. M protein is in brown color. Okay. And then more importantly, we have the nucleo protein, which I have described it in the in the previous slide in the morphology of the coronavirus COVID-19. So now then, what will happen? As I mentioned previously, in this lecture, then the nucleocapsid protein, which is here in red, it will go and join the newly sensitized positive strand coronavirus COVID-19 viral RNA. So you can see here the N protein, which is here in red, is binding to the positive strand coronavirus viral RNA. Then what will happen is this protein, as I mentioned, will be expressed as well, which is the S protein, A protein, and M protein. Now the S protein a protein and M protein of coronavirus, they will go and embed themselves in the rough endoplasmic reticulum membrane inside the cytoplasm of the cell. So here we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and you can see here embedding of the S protein in gray color, the M protein in brown color, Okay, you can see it here. And then the A protein in yellow color. They, they, got, they got embedded in the rough endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Then what will happen after that? This newly formed nucleocapsid, which is the positive strand coronavirus, viral RNA, and the N protein, which bound to it, they will go as well into the, as you see here, the arrow, they will go as well into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then they will meet the newly sensitized protein, which will, which are embedded in the rough endoplasmic 
reticular membrane as I have explained in much more detail in the previous slide. And this result in the process we call it assembly. So when the viral nucleocapsid, which is the viral nucleic acid and the, and the nucleoprotein, when they meet the different types of the coronavirus COVID-19 viral protein, they will meet together in a process we call it assembly. Then this will be followed by the budding of the coronavirus the nucleocapsid and the viral protein. Then after that, this as I mentioned previously, after that, this assembled, this assembled viral nucleocapsid and viral proteins will go into the Golgi or Golgi apparatus, and then it will. After that, they will be taken by a vesicle, and then from the vesicle, these viruses will go, or through the vesicle, will go and will be released from the cell membrane by a process we call it exocytosis. Exocytosis. And then, I, just to mention that the S protein, after its formation, some of it will go and embed itself into the cell membrane of the cell. So then, and you can see some of it are, or so some of the spike protein are embedded in the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. So when the virus nucleic capsid and the virus will be released from the cell, they will take some of the S protein in the cell membrane. So this is the replication or what we know about the replication of coronavirus COVID-19. Okay. So what is the possible origin of coronavirus COVID-19? So how, how a human got infected with coronavirus COVID-19? So what happened is, or what is thought that the coronavirus infected the bat, as you see here in this slide, and then the bat or the coronavirus was transmitted from the bat into another animal. In China, we call it Bangolins. And then genetic recombination occurred in the pangolin and a new virus, which is coronavirus COVID-19, was emerged. And then from the pangolin, a human got infected with coronavirus COVID-19. So this is the possible origin of coronavirus COVID-19. Okay, let's look at the transmission of coronavirus COVID-19 to human. Now, I got this one from the WHO or the World Health Organization. And what they are stating, very simple, that coronavirus infection with coronavirus COVID-19, it can spread from one person into another through small droplet this droplet will be coming from the coming from where from the nose and the mouth of infected individual and then this droplet will be coming out from the nose and the mouth of infected individual and then it can spread from one person to another by cough or exhaling air then what happens is this droplet then they can land on objects or on surfaces around the infected person and then if someone else come and touch these surfaces or objects which are contaminated by the droplet from an infected or from a person infected with the coronavirus COVID-19 then if this person who touched this contaminated surface and then he touch his eye or his nose or his mouth then he or she will become infected with coronavirus COVID-19 also people they can get infected with coronavirus COVID-19 if they put in a droplet from person who they are infected when he coughs or exhale droplets. So if someone is infected with coronavirus COVID-19 and he coughs at your face, you will become infected with the coronavirus COVID-19. So that's why the WHO 
so that's why the WHO recommends that it is very important to stay more than one meter away from the infected individual. Okay. Here, what you can see is, as I mentioned in the previous slide, that if an infected individual with coronavirus, COVID-19, if he cough, the droplet will come out. Then this droplet will be landing on different objects. So then the question is, how long is coronavirus can survive on different types of objects or surfaces? For example, in air, Coronavirus can last or can survive for up to three hours. On copper, for up to four hours. On cardboard, coronavirus can survive or stay alive for up to 24 hours. Stainless steel, for two to three days. On plastic, coronavirus COVID-19, it can stay survived for three days. It means it can stay alive for three days. It means that for three days, it can, you or some individual can get infected from contaminated plastic. Two to three days, individuals can get infected from contaminated stainless steel. Also, individual can get infected for up to 24 hours from contaminated cardboard, four hours from copper, three hours from air. The source of this information is the National Institute of Health. This slide summarizes the pathogenesis of coronavirus COVID-19. As I have mentioned in the previous slide that the coronavirus COVID-19 transmit from one human to another through a droplet. So then what will happen is this droplet will go and enter into the nose or the mouth of the individual and then from the nose and the mouth the virus will go and infect the nasopharynx once the virus infect the nasopharynx the virus will remain in the nasopharynx for up to four days then after that the virus will go and infect the lung in the lung, the virus will be going and infecting the alveoli. Okay, so here is the alveoli. These are the alveoli. If we enlarge the alveoli, you're going to see the cell structure of the human alveoli. Now, the human alveoli it has a cell we call them pneumocyte type two. These are the Nemocyte type 2 cells. This is a nemocyte type 2 cells. Now, the function of the nemocyte type 2 cells, which is these cells, the function of these cells is to produce a substance we call it surfactant. The function of the surfactant is to reduce the air pressure in the alveoli. So what we have said so far, that the virus will be in the droplet, and then the virus through the droplet will enter into the nasopharynx. So someone will inhale the virus, and the virus will go and infect the nasopharynx. And then from the nasopharynx, or in the nasopharynx, the virus will remain for up to four days. And then the virus will be multiplying in the nasopharynx. Then the virus will go in and infect the lung or the, uh, or the lower uh, respiratory tract. And then it will infect the, and it will go and infect the alveoli in the lung. Then I showed you the histological structure of the alveoli. As I mentioned previously, the alveoli, they have a cells, we call them, Nemocyte type 2. So this is a nemocyte type 2. This is a nemocyte type 2. Also, they have other cells. We call them nemocyte type 1 or type 1 alveolar epithelial cells, which is these cells. Okay. 
Then what will happen after that? As I mentioned previously, once the virus infect the nemocyte type 2, then the virus will multiply inside the nemocyte type 2 and replicate as I have described previously inside the nemocyte type 2. This replication of the virus inside the nemocyte type 2 will interfere with the function of these cells. As I mentioned, the function of these cells, it will produce a substance, we call it surfactant. The function of surfactant is to reduce the air pressure in the alveoli. Okay, replication of the coronavirus COVID-19 inside the alveoli will lead into the damage of these nemocyte type 2 cells. The damage of nemocyte type 2 cells will attract macrophages. You see the macrophages here, okay? And these macrophages, these macrophages will release what we call them inflammatory mediators like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor. So then, as I mentioned, the damage or the replication of the virus inside the nemocyte type 2 will attract macrophages. The macrophages will be releasing inflammatory mediator like interleukin type 1, 6, and tumor necrosis factors. These ones, we call them inflammatory mediators. No. no. What this inflammatory mediator will do? This inflammatory mediator, interleukin type 1, interleukin type 6, and tumor necrosis factor will go into the blood vessel surrounding the alveoli. So this is the alveoli which you see it here this is the alveoli surrounding the alveoli there is a blood vessel so this is the a blood vessel surrounding the alveoli so what will happen is as a, again virus will be replicating in nemocyte type 2 damaging nemocyte type 2 this will attract macrophages macrophages will be releasing inflammatory mediator like interleukin 1 interleukin 6 and the tumor necrosis factors this Inflammatory mediators, what they will do is they will go to the blood vessels surrounding the alveoli. So this is the blood vessels. And this will result in the vasodilation of the blood vessels. So these blood vessels surrounding the alveoli will get vasodilated. Once these blood vessels will become vasodilated, then fluid will be leaked, as you see it here, from the, the fluid will be leaked from the blood vessels into the, or toward the alveoli, like what you see here with these red arrows. Okay, so fluid will be, because of the vasodilation, fluid will be leaking from the blood vessel into the alveoli. Now, this will lead to what we call it alveolar edema. Alveolar edema. And the presence of a fluid here around the alveoli will put pressure or induce pressure on the alveoli so the edema here or the presence of the fluid here will produce or pressures on the alveoli and also as i mentioned previously because the virus or coronavirus covid 19 will be damaging the nemocyte type 2 and the function of the nemocyte type 2 is to produce the surfactant and the function of the surfactant is to control or reduce the air pressure in the alveoli so what it means is this means it will result into the damage of the alveoli so the fluid that coming from the blood vessel surrounding the alveoli will cause pressure on the alveoli itself and then the replication of the virus inside the alveoli and especially inside the nemocyte type 2, the nemocyte type 2 is not going to be able to produce surfactant. So then the pressure will be much more. And this will lead to the damage of the alveoli. And this will, the damage in the alveoli will lead to a stop of the gas exchange in the lung. And this, or stopping of the gas exchange, this will lead to something we call it work breathing. Work breathing, it means that the patient will try to or the patient will have difficulty in breathing. Why? He cannot breathe probably. Why? Because there is a lot of a fluid, there is a lot of a fluid in his lung, and there is a, a lot of a fluid that pushing, putting pressures on the alveoli, and because of these pressures, there is no air exchange or no proper air exchange, so then 
the patient will have difficulty in breathing and this is what we call it acute respiratory distress or abbreviation is ARDS also the presence of the inflammatory mediators which is as I mentioned previously the presence of these three inflammatory mediators interleukin 1 interleukin 6 and the tumor necrosis factors these inflammatory mediators will go into the blood and then from the blood they will go into the central nervous system which is the brain and which is the brain and then what it will do is these inflammatory mediator like interleukin 1 interleukin 6 and tumor necrosis factor they will go into the hypothalamus so then the hypothalamus will be producing prostaglandin and then this prostaglandin will lead to fever will lead to fever so now you can see what we have said so far i have explained in the pathogenesis of coronavirus covid 19 how the patient will get what we call it acute respiratory distress infection of the pneumocyte type 2 the virus will infect pneumocyte type 2 the virus multiply on these uh, cells the function of these cells is producing surfactant so then the function of surfactant is to reduce the air or pressure of the air in the alveoli but because the pneumocytes type 2 are damaged because of the infection with coronavirus COVID-19 so then it means that there is no surfactant produced and it means that the, the surfactant cannot perform its function which is reducing the air pressure in the alveoli so it means that there will be a lot of air pressure in the alveoli because of the lack of surfactant also as I mentioned that the virus will multiply in the alveoli macrophages will come and will produce inflammatory mediator like interleukin 1 interleukin 6 and tumor necrosis factors this inflammatory mediator will lead to vasodilation in the blood vessels surrounding the alveoli so this is the blood vessel this is the alveoli so this will result in what in fluid leaking from the blood vessel into the alveoli and this will lead to alveolar edema and the accumulation of the fluid around the alveoli will put more pressure in the alveoli and these pressures will reduce these pressures will lead to the damage of the alveoli and this will affect the function of the alveoli which is air exchange and this damage in the alveoli stop of air exchange this will lead to acute respiratory distress so this is how or this is explaining how patients who are infected with coronavirus COVID-19 they have difficulty in breathing now also inflammatory mediator what they will do is from the blood they will go into the brain then they will go to the hypothalamus and then the hypothalamus will produce more prostaglandin and this will lead to increase of the temperature or the increase of the level of the prostaglandin will affect the thermocenter and this will lead to increase of the temperature or fever so this is how our patient get fever in addition to that because here what we have inside the cells here inside the alveoli we have damaged we have damaged pneumocyte type 2 we have inflammatory cells or white blood cells so then what will happen to the alveoli they have accumulation of a lot of dead cells dead pneumocyte type 2 dead pneumocyte type 1 we have inflammatory cells so this will lead to consolidations as well and this as well will lead to damage of the alveoli and because of this damage in the alveoli the air exchange will be altered and then this will lead to cough so that's why patient with infected with the coronavirus COVID-19 they will have cough okay now also also there is a complication due to the infection with the coronavirus COVID-19 as I mentioned previously we have vasodilation you remember we said that the inflammatory mediators will lead to the fluid leaking from the blood vessels surrounding the alveoli also you have to know that this vasodilation will lead to the decrease in the systemic 
arterial, arterial peripheral resistance and this will lead to the reduction in the blood pressure which we call it hypotension and then what will happen is the hypotension will lead to the decrease in the profusions of many organs in the body and this will result into multi-organ failure for example kidney failure or liver failure also also the reduction of the oxygen it will affect the heart and this will lead to low partial pressure of oxygen this will stimulate the chemoreceptors this will stimulate the sympathetic central nervous system this will result in the increase heart rate and increase in the respiratory rate so this slide i have tried to describe to you and simplify to you the pathogenesis of coronavirus covid 19. what i'm showing you here in this slide is a continuation in describing the pathogenesis of coronavirus covid 19. i got this image from a paper published recently in Lancet Journal in April 2020. The title of this paper is Endothelial Cells Infection and Endotheliitis in COVID-19. What the author of this paper done, they have conducted post-mortem analysis of a patient who died from infection with coronavirus COVID-19. And then what they did is they looked or they conducted electron microscopy on the kidney of this patient who died from infection with coronavirus COVID-19. Electron microscopy or electron microscopic examination of the kidney of the patient who died from coronavirus COVID-19 showed the presence of viral inclusions, as you can see here in this arrow, viral inclusions, viral inclusions in the endothelial cells of the kidney also they conducted histological analysis of the lung for example and what they showed is the presence of inflammatory infiltration you see these inflammatory cells you see them here in the lung of the patient who died from infection with coronavirus covid 19 and as i mentioned in the previous slide when i was describing the pathogenesis of coronavirus covid 19 what i have said is that Replication of the virus in the alveolar cells, like for example, pneumocyte type 2, will attract, will attract macrophages, and these macrophages will be and uh, will be what they will stimulate or release inflammatory mediator like interleukin 1, interleukin 6, and in tumor necrosis factors. So this confirms what I have said in the previous slide, and you can see the presence of inflammatory cells in the lung of a patient died from coronavirus COVID-19. Another a new striking findings by doctors in United States is the finding of blood thickening and blood clotting in coronavirus patients. Doctors detected signs of blood thickening and clotting in different organs in patients infected with coronavirus COVID-19. These findings of blood thickening and clotting in coronavirus infected individuals led the doctors to believe that this type of infection is more than just a lung disease. Previously published reports show that stroke which is a result from blood clotting in coronavirus infected individuals is one of important symptoms of infection with coronavirus COVID-19. Now doctors from many specialties like nephrologists, neurologists and other Specialty doctors, they started to giving patients a new treatment a protocol by giving them a medication that 
leads to the tenor or the tenoring of the blood we call them blood tenors and these medications are given to these patients in order to prevent clot formations in COVID-19 infected individuals hoping that this medication will reduce the severity of the disease by preventing the clotting I have found two previously published papers talking about the findings of blood thickening and clotting in coronavirus infected patient now there is a question needs to be answered can coronavirus cause gastrointestinal tract infections or gastro gastrointestinal infections in recently published study it shows that too severely diseased patient with COVID-19 they could detect coronavirus COVID-19 in their esophagus stomach duodenum and rectum so that providing an evidence that the virus or the coronavirus COVID-19 is present throughout the GIT or the gastrointestinal tract of patient where they are infected with coronavirus COVID-19 also they have or they were able to detect coronavirus COVID-19 in 52% of fecal samples obtained from patient infected with coronavirus COVID-19 so they have or they were able to detect coronavirus COVID-19 in the feces of 52.4 of infected patients so it means that the enteric symptoms or the GIT symptoms which we see in patients who are infected with coronavirus COVID-19 could be contributed by invasion of the virus or coronavirus COVID-19 by invading ACA2 expressing enterocytes and this means what you remember we have said when i was talking in a previous slide regarding the replication of coronavirus COVID-19 i said that the virus the first thing is the virus will bind into the ACA2 receptors on the cell membrane once the virus or coronavirus COVID-19 bound into the ACA2 receptor on the cells then the virus will enter the cells and what we are saying here is we are saying that the virus can infect the enterocytes or the cells of the or intestinal cells and also infect the cells in the GI tract because these cells are expressing the ACA, ACE2 receptors so it means that the virus can infect the gastrointestinal tract so is this meaning that the virus has another route or way of infection which is fecal oral route because you can see here in this slide that if someone is infected with coronavirus COVID-19 he or she will be excreting the virus in their fecal material and this fecal material will contaminate the toilet seat for example and then if someone else come and sit in the same toilet seat or touches the toilet seat and then touches his nose maybe then he or she can get infected these informations I got them from a recently published paper in BMC gut and it's a very well known journal the title of the paper COVID-19 and the gastrointestinal tract more than meets the eye okay if, let's look at the clinical manifestation of infection with the coronavirus COVID-19 the incubation period of infection with coronavirus COVID-19 is from 2 to 14 days clinical manifestation include fever cough and shortness of the breath when I talked about the pathogenesis of coronavirus COVID-19 I explained how these patients after infection with coronavirus COVID-19 how they can have a fever cough and shortness of breath 
For example, for fever, what we said when I was talking about the pathogenesis of coronavirus, COVID-19, that infection of the alveoli with coronavirus, COVID-19, will stimulate macrophages. Macrophages will release inflammatory mediator like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and the tumor necrosis factors. These inflammatory mediators will go into the hypothalamus, and then this will lead to the increase in the level of prostaglandin and this will lead to fever and then i explained the pathogenesis and how infection with coronavirus covid 19 it can lead to cough and respiratory or short uh, manifestation or shortness of the breath okay now we will move into the laboratory diagnosis of coronavirus covid 19 now what we're showing here is the general approaches for establishing a diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19. The first one is molecular, and this is by utilizing real-time polymerase chain reaction and nucleic acid amplification test, or abbreviation is NAAT. Also, we can use serology. Serology will include a rapid test and rapid antigen lateral flu assays, or flow assays, and the second one in the serology is ELISA. So then we have the first approach is molecular, which is by RT-PCR and the nucleic acid amplification test. The second approach to establish a diagnosis of coronavirus COVID-19 is serology, and this includes the rabbit test and ELISA. And the third approach, which is not recommended to be used for the diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19, which is cell culture, but it's not recommended. When the patient come to the hospitals, the doctor suspecting that the patient will be infected with coronavirus COVID-19, the doctor will be ordering a number of laboratory investigation or laboratory tests. One of these tests is CBC or complete blood count. Surprisingly, 85% of patients who they are infected with coronavirus COVID-19, they will have lymphocytopenia or lymphopenia. Lymphopenia will mean reduction in the number of lymphocytes. And this is very strange. Because you remember what I have said to you in my previous lectures that viral infections are associated with lymphocytosis or increase in the number of lymphocytes. But this is not the case in infection with coronavirus COVID-19, 85% of patients will having lymphocytopenia. So it means that their immune system are weak because the number of lymphocytes are low and this is very strange. And this will contribute to the prognosis of patients who they are infected with coronavirus COVID-19. Also, when patients are infected with coronavirus COVID-19, there's another test that we can perform in the lab is to look at the level of brocalcitonin in these patients. If the level of brocalcitonin in coronavirus COVID-19 infected patient is high, it means that these patients are or having secondary bacterial infection in their lungs or in their respiratory tract. However, if the level of Procalcitonin or BCT in patient infected with coronavirus COVID-19 is normal, then it means that they have, don't have a secondary bacterial infection. So what I'm trying to say here is that this is a test that we can do in the lab in order to determine if these patients are having a secondary bacterial infection in their respiratory tract or not. After the infection with coronavirus COVID-19 hit the Wuhan city in China, then the virus appeared and infected American patients. On January 22nd, 2020, the Center of Disease Control received the first clinical sample collected from the first American patient infected with coronavirus COVID-19. Immediately, scientists at the Center of Disease Control propagated this sample in specific cell culture. 
Then after that, the center of disease control developed a test kit. They call it Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC 2019 Novel Coronavirus Real-Time Reverse tra Transcriptase RT-PCR Diagnostic Panel. So this is the kit or the diagram shows the first kit designated or designed by the Center of Disease Control in America. And the Center of Disease Control specified that their kit is intended for use with the applied biosystem 7500 FASTDX real-time PCR instrument with SDS 1.4 software. So this is the instrument or the, this is the applied biosystem 7500 FASTDX real-time PCR machine which can be used with this designed CDC RT-PCR kit for the diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19. If we look at the coronavirus COVID-19 laboratory diagnosis guidelines, now we have, we have the different stages of laboratory investigation. We have the pre-analytical stage, we have the analytical stage, and we have the post-analytical stage. I'm putting them here at the end of the of this slide. So then just you can differentiate between the three different stages of laboratory diagnosis for people who they are not familiar with the system. Pre-analytical, it means positive identification that you can say that this patient is or suspecting the, this individual to be infected then patient preparation then you collect the sample and then you have to meet the sample integrity that the samples are good enough and it's not for example not contaminated and it can be used for establishing a laboratory diagnosis analytical which will include standardization operator competence, analysis, and quality assurance. Most analytical, which include printing the results, interfacing, and then reporting the results to the doctor, and if there is any further communication. So let's go back to coronavirus COVID-19 laboratory diagnosis guidelines. Once we, I have given you the basics in how to differentiate between pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical. In the pre-analytical stage, collecting the proper respiratory tract specimen to investigate for the presence of or, or to investigate for infection with corona virus COVID-19 in the right time and from the right anatomical site is very important in order to establish an accurate diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19. So what that mean is that it means if the doctors or the physicians are not well trained to collect the sample from the right anatomical site and at the right time, this will affect the accuracy of the laboratory diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19. Also, also, appropriate measures, appropriate health and safety measures should be undertaken in order to make sure that the laboratory staff are safe while they are producing a reliable test results to establish a diagnosis with coronavirus COVID-19. Now, in the analytical stage, Usually in the analytical stage, to establish a diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19, we will conduct a real-time RT-PCR, because this is the gold standard technique for establishing a diagnosis or efficient diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19. However, in addition to RT-PCR, other tests looking for Antibodies has been developed as a, as a supplementary tool 
to RT PCR. Then, more importantly, the post analytical stage. It means that once you complete the test, then you have to analyze the result. This should be carefully interpreted. Interpreted. Very careful. Because if your if your post analytical analysis is is inaccurate, then you might give the false result. So that's why analysis of the data is very important. Okay. Let's look at the serological diagnosis of coronavirus COVID-19 infection. Now, the first group of assays that currently utilized in the diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19, we have the rapid assay. Okay. So what it means, it means that we have a rapid assays or immunoassays that they have been established and developed for the quick or rapid detection of infection with the coronavirus COVID-19 or we can call it SARS-CoV-2. These rapid tests, we are using them to detect coronavirus COVID-19 antigens or antibodies. These tests, or one of these tests that we are currently used in order to establish a rapid diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19, we call it lateral flow assays. We are going to describe this assays in much more detail in the next slide. Now, these rapid tests, you can perform them in a human whole blood, serum, or plasma. Now, I mentioned here, and I talked here about the lateral flow assay. What is the lateral flow assay? This lateral flow assay, it has been developed for detecting antigens of coronavirus COVID-19. So this lateral flow assay, we can use it to detect coronavirus COVID-19 antigens or detecting IgM and IgG antibodies against the coronavirus COVID-19. What you see here in this gram is, this is one of the rapid tests that we are using in order to establish a diagnosis of coronavirus COVID-19, or we can call it as a supplementary test to establish a rapid diagnosis with coronavirus COVID-19. This slide demonstrates the principles of the rapid assays, or the rapid antigen lateral flow assay. Now, we are buying these rapid assays commercially. So then when you buy this rabbit assay commercially this is what they look like you will get this type of cassette now the cassette will contain this opening or hole this is where you add the clinical sample for example you can add blood or plasma as we have mentioned or serum as we have mentioned previously now let's look at the principles and how this rabbit assay work so as i mentioned here this is the cassette which you get when you buy these uh, rabid assays. Now, I have said that you have this, you can see this is the cassette and you can see this hole. This is where you add the clinical specimen, which could be, as I mentioned previously, whole blood serum or plasma. So this is the hole. So this is the cassette and this is the hole where you add your clinical sample. Let's say the whole blood. Now, this is what we call it the, sim the sample bed. Then what we have is what we call it conjugate release bed. More importantly here, we have this membrane. Now, this membrane, it will contain what we call it test line. Test line, what's the test line? Test line is, means that it is impregnated with antibodies against coronavirus COVID-19. So then if I'm looking for the presence of coronavirus COVID-19 antigen in this blood sample, so this one will be impregnated with, or the strip here, or the membrane will be impregnated with coronavirus COVID-19 antibodies. Also, we have another line, we call it a control line. What is a control line? This is just internal control or a positive control but not for COVID-19 it's only for 
any other protein which is not related to COVID-19. Just this is a line or the presence of this line just to tell us that the technique is working or not. So this is an internal control. Okay. This is what we call it the backing card. And here we have another adsorbent band. Now, so what will happen, as I mentioned previously, we add the blood sample in this opening or hole, like what you see here. Then the blood will, and then we add a buffer. Then what will happen is the blood or the sample, which could be serum or plasma as well, will migrate or flow in this direction. Once it's flow in this direction, it will go into this membrane. And as I mentioned, it contains the test line and the control line. Now, say for example, if I'm looking for the presence of coronavirus COVID-19, so then I have here anti-coronavirus antibodies. So then what will happen is that when the sample reach this membrane and the test line, so then you'll have antibody antigen reaction. And if the patient is infected, he or she will have the coronavirus COVID-19. So then you will get this red band. Then the sample will immigrate in this direction. And then any internal control protein, like for example, it could be, for example, beta actin or housekeeping uh, gene products, then you get this line. It will go to this line. Then after that, you read your results. How to read your results? You leave after adding the sample. You wait for about 8 to 10 minutes, and then you look for the results. If you see a band in the control line and in the test line, it means that this patient is positive for infection with coronavirus COVID-19. If you see only band in the control line, and no band in the test line, it means that the patient is negative. The patient is negative. So why? Because if the if the blood sample or the whole blood sample contain is from a patient affected with coronavirus COVID-19, so most probably there's a virus in the blood. So then when you add it into the sample bed, it will migrate. And then once it will reach the membrane, which is contain or if it is, uh, which is, it is immobilized with antibodies against coronaviruses, so then the antigen in the blood sample will react to the antibody in the, which is immobilized in the membrane, which we're going to have antigen antibody reaction, and then we have a chemical reaction, and then a red color line will be produced. Then the sample, as I mentioned previously, will go to the control line, and you get another band here. And then it will migrate, and this the absorbent band will stop the sample from leaking out. So this is the principles of the rabbit assay for, for detection of coronavirus COVID-19. Also, this assay, as I have mentioned in the previous practicals, can be used to detect other different types of viruses. Again, what you see here in this slide is the rapid assay protocol or we call it quick reference guide for coronavirus covid-19 igm igg rapid test kit so the first step is you collect the blood from the fingertip of the patient then after collecting the blood so then what you need is you puncture the skin of the fingertip and then you using a pipette you collect the blood then what you will do is in step three you will uh, you drop the blood sample from the pipette into dilution buffer then you mix the dilution buffer with the blood sample then what you will do is step five you add this diluted blood sample through this hole in the cassette so let's as you see here so this is the cassette and then you add the diluted blood into this uh, hole and then you wait for about eight to ten minutes and then you read your results so if the patient is infected you get two lines as i mentioned in the previous slide a line in the control and the other line which is the test line so this patient is positive if you see only band in the control line there is no band in the test line the patient is negative or not infected if you see that there is no bands in the control line nor in the test line it means that something is wrong with your test 
and the test is invalid. So you have to repeat the test. What you see here in this slide, this is a rapid assay produced by a company called Biomedomex, and this is for the detection of COVID-19, IgM and IgG, and then you can see the content of the, this kit, which is provided by Biomediumwex, and you can see this is the cassette, this is the diluent buffer, okay, and this is the pipette that we use, as I mentioned previously, to collect the blood and to place the blood in the buffer. Okay, let's look how we establish the interpretations of the results for infection with coronavirus COVID-19. So as I mentioned previously, if the patient is negative, if the patient is negative, you see only one band in the control line. So this is the control, this is IgG, and this is IgM. Negative, you see only one band in the control line. If the patient is IgM positive, you see two bands, one in the control line and one in the IgM band, which is this one. If the patient is IgG positive, you see one band in the control line and one band in the IgG. If the patient is positive for both IgM and IgG, then you see one band in the control line, in the IgG, and the IgM. So it's the three lines. So this is how you establish the interpretations of the rapid assay for coronavirus COVID-19 IgM IgG. This slide shows in much more detail the principles and the protocol of performing lateral flow rapid assay for the detection of different viruses with special reference to coronavirus COVID-19. So the first step, as you see here in this slide, is the collection of blood from the fingertip of the patient. Usually we collect about 30 microliter of blood sample. Then after that, as I mentioned previously, this is the cassette, similar to the one that I have described in the previous slide, then you place the blood sample in the cassette. Then what will happen? This is the membrane in the cassette, and then if the blood sample, which we got here, contains coronavirus COVID-19 antigen, so then coronavirus COVID-19 antigen will be reacting with the amobilized antibody in the membrane in the cassette. So we have antibody antigen reactions. In the previous protocol, what we have said that we have done is that you place the cassette for 8 to 10 minutes and then you see the results or the line in the control line and in the test line, you see them by naked eye as, for example, red lines. In this test, we have what we call it LFA reader. So in this test, we are using a different approach. We are using a LFA reader in order to read the results for us. And this LFA reader will be able to quantify and give us quantified data for the viral antigen in the blood sample. So then what you see here, this is the LFA reader, and then you place the cassette in the LF reader, or sorry, LFA reader, and then, as I mentioned previously, this LFA reader will give you a quantified result or semi-quantified result on the level of the virus in the blood sample. Now, in this slide, it's describing the advantages and disadvantages of rapid assays. Rapid assays or rapid antigen lateral flow assays, as I have described them previously, they have advantages and disadvantages. Their advantages, or the first advantage, that they are fast, that you can get a result in a short time, for up to 8 to 10 minutes, as I have described previously. Also, these rapid tests, they are cheap and not expensive. So we call them a low-cost 
detection of SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus COVID-19. But the disadvantage or the main disadvantage of these rapid tests is that they are suffer from poor sensitivity. They suffer from poor sensitivity in comparison to other techniques like real-time polymerase chain reaction. Now here we see another technical approach which we are currently utilizing for establishing a, labor a laboratory diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19, which is coronavirus COVID-19 ELISA kits. And what you see here in this slide is ELISA IgM kit. ELISA IgM kit. So you can see it here. This is the name of the company, ADI Novel Coronavirus COVID-19 IgM ELISA kit. This slide describing the detection protocol for coronavirus COVID-19, IgM and IgG by ELISA. This is the detection protocol for coronavirus COVID-19, IgG. And here is the detection a protocol of coronavirus COVID-19 IgM by ELISA. These two kits are manufactured by the company called EDI. EDI, and this is the catalog number for each kit. So this is the catalog number for the IgG kit, and this is the catalog number for the IgM kit. Let's start with the IgG protocol, or coronavirus COVID-19 ELISA, IgG protocol. So here we have the microtheter well of the ELISA, and then to this microtheter well, you add 100 microliter of a control and one 200 diluted clinical sample into this microtheter well or micro well. Now, this well is you buy it coated with COVID 19 recombinant protein. Then you incubate for 30 minutes and then you wash. After that, you add 100 microliter of horseradish peroxidase labeled COVID-19 tracer antibody. Then you incubate again for 30 minutes and then you wash. And then you add 100 microliter of the substrate which is provided by the kit manufacturer. Then you incubate after adding the substrate, you incubate for 20 minutes. And then you add 100 microliter of the stop solution to stop the reaction. And then you read your results, results within 10 minutes using ELISA reader. And you read the absorbance at 450 nanometers. So this is for the IgG kit. For the IgM kit, which is different from what we have described for, uh, in the IgG protocol. So the IgM protocol is slightly different from the IgG protocol for the detection of coronavirus COVID-19 by ELISA. So for the IgM protocol for the detection of infection with coronavirus COVID-19 by ELISA, for the IgM protocol, you add 100 microliter of the control. Then you add 10 microliter of the clinical sample. And then you add 100 microliter of sample diluent into this micro well and this micro well is coated with anti-human IgM specific antibody. Then you incubate for 30 minutes at 37 degrees centigrade and then you wash. Then you add 100 microliter of the horse reddish peroxidase labeled with labeled COVID-19 antigen. Then you incubate for 30 minutes at 37 and then you wash. Then you add 100 microliter of the substrate, incubate for 20 minutes, then you add 100 microliter of the stop solution, and then after 10 minutes, you can read the results by using uh, uh, ELISA readers and you read the absorbance at 450 nanometers, and as I mentioned, by using a micro plate reader or ELISA reader. So this is the uh, protocol for the detection of coronavirus COVID-19 
ELISA IGM and IGG. If we look at the efficiency of serological diagnosis of coronavirus COVID-19 in comparison to real-time PCR. Now, after the appearance of the pandemic of coronavirus COVID-19, many companies and manufacturers they have developed a huge number of different serological approaches for the diagnosis of coronavirus COVID-19. If we look at the test like for which I have described previously, like the rapid lateral flow assay, which we can use to detect both IgG, IgG and IgM antibodies, these tests are important and they played a role in establishing a diagnosis of COVID-19. And because these tests are simple to perform and they are cheap, so it can be used to detect asymptomatic infections and also because they are cheap and easy to perform so then we can utilize them in epidemiological studies or to identify or to screen a huge number of individuals especially asymptomatic and that's why these tests are useful even that they have some disadvantages or drawback that they have a poor sensitivity but because of their low cost and because they are fast to perform or give fast results and easy to perform so this can be used to screen a number of individuals or a high number of individuals and to screen asymptomatic infection in addition it has been shown that the IgM responses are notoriously non-specific and if you would like to wait for the patient to develop IgG after the development of IgM it will take a long time it take more than a week so it means that serological detections it does not or not likely to play an, a role or active role in case of case management but serologically can be used to diagnose to confirm late COVID-19 cases or we can use it to determine the immunity of healthcare workers especially that the healthcare workers at a high risk of infection because they are in direct contact with patients so this will bring us to conclude that the gold standard approach so far for diagnosis of coronavirus COVID-19 is real-time BCR on nasopharyngeal swab. In the last few slides, I have described the laboratory diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19, and we have talked about different serological approaches or laboratory serological approaches for establishing a diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19 and then in the last slide I have talked about the efficacy of serological diagnosis of coronavirus COVID-19 and then in the last slide I have stated that real-time BCR is the gold standard technique for establishing a diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19 however as you see here in this slide there is facts that we know on utilizing real-time PCR for establishing a diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19. It has been shown that RT-PCR test it can be performed on throat swabs only in the first week of the disease or of the infections. However, after one week, the coronavirus COVID-19 may be disappear from the throat. So then you cannot detect it in the throat swab. Why? Because the virus will start to multiply in the lung. So the virus will be going into the lower respiratory tract. For this reason, people infected and tested in the second week, we have to collect alternative sample material from them rather than a throat swab. This alternative sample material must be collected from the deep airways by utilizing a suction catheter. So this is a what the suction catheter would look like. 
or by collecting cuffed up material from uh, these people this cuffed, uh, cuffed up material is like the sputum so then we can perform real-time PCR on their sputum or on individuals who they are tested in the second week of infection also recently food and the drug administration in or FDA in America they have generated what we call it emergency use authorizations and this is to use or to conduct RT-PCR on saliva rather than on performing PCR on RNA extracted from nasal swab and of course if we can perform the test in saliva it will be much easier than on the nasal swab in terms of collecting the sample because it's very easy to collect saliva rather than collecting nasal swab as collecting nasal swab it is more difficult to collect in comparison to saliva these are the two references which describing what I have stated previously in this slide there is two different contradictory reports in the literatures regarding the possibility of using computed tomography or CT scan for establishing a diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19 however the, the current imaging best practice advice that CT chest scan cannot be used to diagnose COVID-19 infection but maybe that a chest CT scan is helpful in assessing for the complications just then when giving you two examples of these two contradictory report a study conducted by AIT Yang and Zerhu and published in radiology journal in the year 2020 what they found they found that 90% of cases with RT-PCR confirmed diagnosis had CT finding of pneumonia and these two authors AIT Yang and Zihu H they conclude in their paper that CT imaging or computed tomography has a high sensitivity for diagnosis of infection with COVID-19 however another or other investigators led by a new and published in recently in journal of radiology in the year 2020 they were less optimistic on using of CT scan to establish of diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19 in you and his colleagues reviewed the CT scan of 120 cases of RT-PCR confirmed COVID-19 from patient found in the diamond princess cruise ship and what they found that they found that less than two-thirds which is 61 percent of cases had lung obesity on CT scan however 20 percent of symptomatic patients with coronavirus COVID-19 had a negative CT scan so it means that CT scan missed to diagnose infection with coronavirus COVID-19 in 20 percent of symptomatic patients so that's why they came to the conclusion that you cannot use CT scan to establish a diagnosis of infection with coronavirus COVID-19 however it's up to you and also we will see the future research on the possibility of using a CT scan for the diagnosis of coronavirus COVID-19 what you see here in this slide is coronavirus CT scan or chest CT scan and this, this is the CT scan of the lung and you can see the what we call it the white patches or ground glass why we see white patches or ground glass in the CT scan 
of the lung in coronavirus COVID-19 infected individuals because the lung is filled with fluid. So that because the lung is filled with the fluid, it will show up on the CT scan in the form of white patches, which we call it ground glass. And if you remember in the previous slide, when I was talking about the pathogenesis of infection of coronavirus COVID-19, what I have said is that in that slide, we have said that infection with coronavirus COVID-19 will infect type 2 pneumocytes of the alveoli and what will happen is macrophages will come, will release inflammatory mediator like interleukin 1, interleukin 6 and tumor necrosis factor. And then what will happen, these inflammatory mediators will increase the vascularity of the blood cells surrounding the alveoli and fluid will be leaking from the blood vessels into the alveoli in the lung and this will result into the alveolar edema or accumulation of a fluid in the lung and this is what we see here in this CT scan or chest CT scan in a patient infected with coronavirus COVID-19 if we look at the treatment of coronavirus COVID-19, until now, there isn't any effective treatment against infection with coronavirus COVID-19. However, now there is many drugs are still on clinical trials, and one of the one of these drug it could be the future effective drug for the treatment of infection against coronavirus COVID-19. This drug is remdesivir. Remdesivir, it is adenosine nucleotide analog. And this drug is found to interfere with the action of the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. You remember at the beginning of this lecture, I have talked to you regarding the replication of coronavirus COVID-19, and I have stated that after the entry of coronavirus COVID-19 into the cell and in the, in the cytoplasm, the coronavirus COVID-19 RNA will be released from the capsid, and then we will have a naked viral RNA in the cytoplasm of infected cells and then this naked viral coronavirus COVID-19 in the cytoplasm under the influence of RNA dependent RNA polymerase will convert into negative sense or negative strand coronavirus COVID-19 RNA and then this enzyme as well will are playing an important role in the replication and the synthesis of viral RNA however Remdesivir, by interfering with the mode of action of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase as adenosine and nucleotide analog, this will result in stopping the replication of viral RNA. And uh, stopping the replication of viral RNA will kill the virus. If you are interested in the mode of action of remdesivir, you can go into this uh, link. Another drug, which is also mentioned in the literatures to be used for the treatment of infection against coronavirus COVID-19, is hydroxychloroquine. Now, the mode of action of hydroxychloroquine is endosome undertaken. You remember what we have said previously when I have talked about uh, the replication of coronavirus COVID-19. What we said is that the coronavirus COVID-19 will attach by its spike protein into the cell receptor. This will follow it by the entry of the virus into the cell by endocytosis. By endocytosis. And then in this endocytosis, you will have the coronavirus COVID-19 inside a small vesicle. And then what will happen is the BH will be dropped in this physical and this will promote the fusion between the virus envelope and the membrane of this endosomal vesicles in order to release the virus into the cytoplasm. However, hydroxy hydroxychloroquine 
it will prevent the drop in the BH of the vesicles. So it means that hydroxychloroquine will inhibit the fusion of the physical membrane with the viral envelope. So it will prevent the passage of the virus into the cell cytoplasm. So it means that the virus cannot continue with its cycle of replication and the virus will die. So this is the mode of action of hydroxychloroquine. Another, another treatment or another drug which is retronavir and this is a protease inhibitor. Another drug which we call it tocilizumab. Now all of the previously mentioned drugs like remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine and retinonavir, all of these drugs are interfering with the replication cycle of the virus. However, tocilizumab it does not interfere with the replication cycle of the virus. However, you remember when I was talking about the pathogenesis of coronavirus COVID-19, what I have said is that the coronavirus COVID-19 will be infecting the alveoli and infecting the pneumocyte type 2 cells and this will attract macrophages and then followed by the release of inflammatory mediators and these inflammatory mediators will include interleukin 1 and interleukin 6 and then what I said that these inflammatory mediators will cause damage these inflammatory mediators will lead to increase the vascularity of the blood vessels and then fluid will come from the blood vessels surrounding the alveoli and increase the pressure of the alveolar of the alveoli so this drug which is tocilizumab it will stop the action of the inflammatory mediator interleukin 6 so tocilizumab is a monoclonal antibodies against the interleukin 6 receptor so they will stop the damage caused by interleukin 6. So this is another drug used for the treatment of infection with coronavirus COVID-19. But as I mentioned, it has no effect on the viral replications. However, it's affecting or stopping interleukin 6 and it is a monoclonal antibodies against interleukin 6 receptor. What you see this slide, this is a table which I have got from the net from the Wikipedia and it will tell you COVID-19 candidate drug treatment in phase 3 and phase 4 trials. And here is the candidate uh, drugs. So, so this is the remdesivir, this is the candidate drug, and mode of action as I mentioned previously, it's antivirus adenosine nucleotide analog and it's inhibiting RNA synthesis of coronavirus. And then here is the, for example, the company or the existing disease approval, a trial sponsor WHO and the company called Gliad and Enserum, and the location of, of the company is China, Japan, and the expected results for this clinical trial will be in April, and this is in Chinese and Japanese trial. The second drug which I have mentioned is hydroxychloroquine, and then another drug we have, which is we call it Fivibravir. It's as well antiviral drug. It's commonly used against influenza, but now they are trying to use it for the treatment of coronavirus COVID-19. And you can see here the list of other uh, drugs. And also, you may forget, don't forget this drug, which I have mentioned in the previous slide, which is Tocilizumab. And as I mentioned, this is a human monoclonal antibodies against interleukin-6 receptor. And the trial sponsors is the company we call it Genotech Hoffman LaRoche. So this is the, the sponsored company for the, the using of Tocelo Zamba. A location where the clinical trial is conducted is in multiple countries and we're hoping we get the expected result in the mid 2020. Now if we look at is there a valid or available vaccine for against coronavirus COVID-19? Now, all over the world, there is about 100 vaccines, but all of them, they are still under development. Now, these vaccines consisted of a fragment of COVID-19 cDNA cloned into the measles vector. So they have used, remember we have talked about viral vectors like adenoviral vectors, and then what we said is that you can use this viral vector, and then you can insert a piece of 
coronavirus COVID-19 cDNA into these viral vectors and then you can use it as a potential vaccine. This research work is conducted in Institute Pasteur in France. Another group they are using coronavirus COVID-19 viral protein subunits as a potential future vaccine and this work is carried in the University of Queensland. Some group they are trying to use a live attenuated vaccine and this work is carried out by Codagenix and uh, Serum in a com uh, this company is Indian drug companies. And then another type of vaccine is DNA plasmid vaccine and this work is carried out or this vaccine is still under development by a company called it Inovio Pharmaceuticals. As I mentioned previously, we have nearly about 100 vaccines, but, th but they are still under construction. Construction of effective vaccines with the clinical trials against coronavirus COVID-19, it will take from 12 to 18 months. Sky News recently published a report stating that the married couple behind the successful Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Other broadcasting agencies like CNN, Al Jazeera, also they have published the same report which has been delivered to the public and to the scientific community. Professor Ugar Sahin and Professor Oslim Tursi, they founded a pharmaceutical company, they call it BioNTech. This company developed the 90% effective coronavirus COVID-19 vaccine. What you see here in this diagram, the two famous professors, Yugur Sahin and Oslim Turki, who founded or identified this new coronavirus COVID-19 vaccine. This vaccine, in collaboration with the famous company Pfizer, is utilizing a messenger RNA or mRNA technology and this technology utilizes the mRNA as a tool in order to create a protein from the virus and this protein will stimulate the immune system against the coronavirus COVID-19. One problem regarding this vaccine because it's an RNA vaccine or messenger RNA based vaccine. In general, RNA or messenger RNA are there, they are very fragile and sensitive and they can get degraded very easily. That's why RNA needs to be stored at a very low temperature around minus 70 degrees centigrade. And this is the problem with this vaccine because it's an mRNA based vaccine, so it must be stored at a super cooled, super cold temperature. And that will make this vaccine extremely difficult to deliver to many places. However, Pfizer representative indicated that they are confident that this issue can be controlled or managed. If we look at the the prognosis of individuals who got infected with coronavirus COVID-19. The prognosis to the infection with coronavirus COVID-19 depends on the following factors. The first factor is age. It has been shown that elderly people, they have a poor prognosis if they got infected with coronavirus COVID-19 in comparison to young people. The second factor is immunosuppression. If there is an individual that he or she are immunosuppressant, for example, due to organ transplantations, their prognosis is poor in comparison to immunocompetent individual. The third factor is individual with cardiovascular diseases. Individual with, uh, with cardiovascular diseases, they have a poor prognosis if they got infected with coronavirus COVID-19. Also, diabetic patients, they will have a poor prognosis if they got infected with coronavirus COVID-19. 
Okay, let's look at the preventions from coronavirus COVID-19. Let's look at the WHO or the World Health Organization recommendations. The World Health Organizations gave us a number of recommend recommendations in order to protect us from infection with coronavirus COVID-19. The first one, say, stay, which means stay at home as much as you can. Keep a safe distance from other people. Wash your hands often. Cover your cuff. Also, you need to wear a mask, not any mask. It has to be, for example, N95 mask, as you see here in this diagram. And if you got sick or you got infected, then make a call to the health authority. Another important, another important element in prevention is what we call it here COVID-19 pyramid or pyramid. Now, in COVID-19 pyramid, you can see that in this pyramid, in this diagram, you can see at the top of the pyramid, this is shows the percentage of death, followed by severe cases. Then we have the symptomatic cases or the ones that they have fevers. Now, these three parts of the pyramid, death, severe cases, and symptomatic cases, comprise of around 60% of coronavirus COVID-19 infected individuals. These ones are cases that we are or diagnosed, that we know. So then we can put them under quarantine. We can prevent them from getting communication with other people. So then they cannot transmit the infection with coronavirus COVID-19 to other people in the public. Now, the more importantly is these, the one that they are at the bottom of the pyramid, because the ones at the bottom of the pyramid, they are the asymptomatic cases. So they are the ones that we don't know anything about them. They are not identified, they are not diagnosed. And these ones comprise 40% of the total of infected individuals. So they are a great source and a serious source of spreading of the infection to the public. Why? Because these people they are asymptomatic and because they are asymptomatic, so we don't know anything about them. They are, uh, they are carrying the virus, they have no symptoms, but they can transfer, transmit the virus to the others. So they are an important source of infection. And that's why countries like United States, like uh, England, they are doing millions of laboratory diagnoses run to rand randomly to individuals in order to identify these asymptomatic cases. So they conducted a randomized laboratory test to identify asymptomatic cases. And once they identify them, they isolate them. So then they were stopping them from spreading the infection to the public. And that's why it is very important that every country should start, if not started already, random laboratory testing to identify these asymptomatic carrier. After talking about the prevention of infection with coronavirus COVID-19, I would like to conclude this lecture and to ask you if you found this lecture interesting to subscribe to Mohammed Magbrook Microbiology World channel. And at the end, I would like to thank you again and ask you to be safe. Thank you.